Welcome to Afternoon Briefing. Greg Jennett with you this Wednesday, uh, Thursday, in fact, from Parliament House in Canberra on Ngunnawal land. And Fran Kelly's with us uh, from our Sydney studios on the land of the Gadigal people. Welcome, Fran. I'm getting my days all mixed up. You do that after a long weekend. Feels like Thursday for some reason. But we have an awful lot to get through today. In fact, we might even run a bit longer than normal, Fran. Yeah, we're going to run a bit longer. It is Wednesday for everyone who's a bit confused. <laughs> um, and, you know, it is confusing sometimes, Greg. There's certainly been a lot of times over the last 17 days when this campaign has been pretty light on for policy debate and new ideas and it's been all about the sledging. Today, I think it's fair to say we've got a mix of both with some fairly arresting inflation figures, the highest in 20 years, and yet another argument over climate and emissions. Yeah, and to add to all of that, Fran, Labor's economics team has laid out a $5 billion plan to drag in more tax from multinational corporations to cut the use of consultants and then to review in office a raft of coalition projects and promises to inspect and examine whether they should be cancelled. Hello, hello everyone. Good if you guys are from on this side or that side. What's your name? Mick. Hey Mick, good to see you mate. Lovely to meet you. I'm Amanda. So I heard it's been pretty dry. Josh and I understood as we went into this budget that we had to ensure that we were going to deliver cost of living relief for Australians right now. Right now. In this country, under Scott Morrison, everything is going up except people's pay. What we are facing today is higher inflation in Australia at 5.1%, but as I pointed out, inflation is higher in the rest of the world. We've got one of the most expensive childcare systems in the world. Our policy will mean on average they'll save up to $1,600 a year. What you can see here is yes, there are inflationary pressures in all the major economies around the world. Have a look at this graph which is cost of living over the last year under Scott Morrison. And what that shows is that the cost of living pressures have been building uh, since before the war in Ukraine. But is that a dinosaur? And the average cost of rent is now two grand more this year than it was 12 months ago. Who has been able to keep inflation lower than all the advanced economies of the world? This bloke is so out of touch you'd need the Hubble telescope to find him. Oh. <laughs> Australian are getting absolutely smashed by the rising cost of living on Scott Morrison's watch. This is Scott Morrison's triple whammy. The choice we're asking you to make is to consider who do you think of the Liberals and Nationals or Labor and the Greens are more likely to be able to put downward pressure on those rising pressures on prices. Yeah, you've got to move quick. <laughs> like us, the Pilio. <laughs> OK, so let's start out with inflation, the number one talking point of the day, really, running at an annual rate of just over 5% or 2.1 for the first three months of this year. Newly built houses and fuel were among the many items to see their prices surge, as every motorist might remember looking back through January, February and March when Bowser prices burst through the $2 a litre mark. We were experiencing fuel price spikes that the world hadn't actually seen since the Gulf War. And Fran, if that wasn't painful enough, the real sting might now be in what lies ahead with the Reserve Bank having to consider its reaction as early as next month. That's right. Well, as early as next week, really, Greg, this inflation figure, well above economists' expectations of 5.1%, has led to a call for the Reserve Bank to raise rates next week, not next month, or is next week next month? I've got myself confused. Yeah, we're all there. That's contentious. Whatever it is, it's smack bang in the middle of an election campaign. Would that be seen as a political act by an independent bank board? Some economists argue it would be a political act for the bank not to raise rates next week when inflation pressures demand it should, just because we're in election mode. It's not unheard of, Greg, you'd remember there was a rate rise during the 2007 election campaign. That election, of course, brought a change of government, though it wasn't really thought at the time the rate rise was a determining factor in the election of Kevin Rudd. Fun fact, 
Rates back then in 2007 rose 0.25% to 6 and 3 quarter percent. Today we're talking about rates rising from record lows of 0.1 percent. So very, very different times. Yeah, but no matter your starting position, uh, when they go up, it still inflicts pain, uh, whether That's you're coming right. off a really low base or figures that seem really, really high to us these days. So Josh Frydenberg, friend, he fronted in Melbourne and struggled in some ways to conceal his disappointment. He was fairly sober in demeanour, even if Australia's inflation rate by by some consolation, is running behind other countries. He's already looking forward, though, jo Josh Frydenberg, to the budget's cuts in fuel excise showing up in the next set of inflation figures. Today's higher inflation numbers are a reminder to Australians that we are living in a complex and volatile economic environment. Today's inflation numbers are a reminder to all Australians of the importance of strong and effective economic management. And today's inflation numbers are a reminder to Australians as they head to the polls in just a few weeks about the choice that they will be making. This is not a time to put at risk the gains that we have made. We have come too far. This is a time for strength and stability. Well, we told you there was some policy about today. Labor's campaign caravan rolled into Canberra. The Treasury trio of... Shadow Treasury trio, of course, of Jim Chalmers, Katie Gallagher and Andrew Lee to release Labor's tax and budget policy, including a commitment of multinational tax hikes. But, Greg, for an election that began with cost of living at its core, today is all about the inflation number and what it might mean for interest rates smack bang in the middle of this campaign. And the Shadow Treasurer, Jim Chalmers, he was onto it. The Reserve Bank Governor has said for some time now to expect that interest rates will rise no matter who is in office. And clearly after today's incredibly high inflation number, there'll be more speculation about a rate rise next week. If you think about all of the challenges that Australians are facing, including some that you've identified, groceries are going up, you know, childcare is expensive, power bills are still expensive. And to add to that pain, we will have an interest rate rise. This is the triple whammy that Scott Morrison has presided over. Wages going backwards in real terms, cost of living going through the roof and now an interest rate rise as well. OK, so let's talk about that one minor piece of housekeeping, though, Fran, we do want to remind viewers that we are on multiple platforms, including live on YouTube today. But why don't we go through those points just raised there by Jim Chalmers, this triple whammy of bills up, uh, low wages and an interest rate rise in the not too distant future. Not all of these fall under direct government control, but all in some way reflect the settings that governments are putting in place, Fran. I suppose more importantly politically is if you want to own it in the context of an election campaign, which clearly Scott Morrison does, campaigning on the economy, the economy, the economy, then you've got to take uh, the good with the bad. And they got well, the bag to bad today. Well, that's right. I mean, uh, Treasurer Josh Frydenberg does want to own the low unemployment rate of 4%. For that Sometime the government's been pushing that as a measure of the government's success of managing the economy in the way it's handled the, um, had, had the way it's handled the pandemic and all that spending and noting the international relativities and how Australia does well on a number of those markets. So the government wants to own them. Uh, Labor's saying, well, here's pin the tail on the donkey. You own that, now you've got the yeah. inflation number, you can own that too. And if interest rates go up, you can, uh, you can own that too. So that's, um, you know, th that's where it's at. And... Um, this goes directly, in a way, to the central messages of both sides in this campaign, Greg. We heard the Prime Minister there and the Treasurer, rather, saying, you know, don't, in the midst of such difficult challenges, a high inflation uh, environment like this, don't risk Labor. And Labor's campaign slogan all through this is everything's going up except your wages. So, yeah, there so there's plenty, there's plenty for them to pick over and they will. I suppose there was a disruptive influence coming from these inflation figures today because it did mix the game up somewhat. Moving us on from uh, some of the ruts that we've been in and arguing about, or which we've been reporting on anyway, over the last three or four days, Solomon Islands and national security mm. all swept aside as we went back to the economy today. 
That's right. Well, everyone expected today's inflation figures would increase. No one quite predicted, though, this headline inflation rate of 5.1 per cent, the highest annual level in more than 20 years. The big question now is, will the Reserve Bank increase interest rates when it meets next week? I'm joined now by Joe Masters, Chief Economist at Baron Joey, and Sally Old, Chief Investment Officer at JB Weir. Thank you both of you for joining us. Great right to be with you. Sally, what does it mean day to day for everyone watching? What's going up? What's gone up here? And does everyone share in the pain equally here? So I, I think it, it's very clear that, you know, a large part of non-discretionary spending is going up. So quarterly inflation went up by 2.1%. And basically three quarters of the rise in inflation can be accounted for by housing, by food and by transport, which is effectively petrol. So all those things are, you know, I think most households would describe as necessities. Um, and what we know is that for households with lower disposable income, periods where cost of living pressures are very intense affect them uh, disproportionately more than, than high income or wealthier households. And Joe, is this the top of the pain cycle when it comes to inflation or is it going to get worse? We heard the Treasurer say or that he hopes the, um, the petrol excise cut will sort of feed into a better inflation figure next time. Where do you see it heading? Well, the excise cut will bring down petrol and that does have a big influence on headline inflation. But it may not be the peak in inflation pressures because what was evident in today's numbers is that businesses for the first time in many years are able to pass on some of these cost increases through to consumers. So we actually saw broad-based inflation pressures. About a third of the items in the CPI basket rose by more than 2% in the quarter alone. Is there a danger here, Joe's, to stick with you on this, that businesses, some businesses, um, everyone's been feeling the pinch, I suppose, through the pandemic, um, but might see the cover, use the cover, if you like, of higher inflation to put up prices beyond where the inflation pressures are actually hitting? Well, I guess that's always possible. Um, if you see an opportunity to increase your profit margin, it's very tempting to do that. But, you know, as Sally just talked about, we know that there are these cost of living pressures. Wage growth has not been rising as fast as inflation. So real wages are going backwards. And price increases have been really much higher for essential goods and services. So if you're selling into the retail space or indiscretionary spending, you've got to compete with that uh, in order to get volume through. So I don't think we'll see a big explosion in margins. All right, Sally, we're in the middle of an election campaign. There's a lot of blame being thrown around here. Let's put that aside, though, and, and ask what's causing this. Is this a result of international inflationary factors? There's no doubt that what has played out on international financial markets, particularly commodity markets, um, has had a big impact on inflation, not just in Australia, but right around the world. And in fact, we look at what global inflation did in the month of March. It had its biggest monthly rise in 30 years. So... This is something that's not just a uniquely Australian phenomenon. We're seeing it in, in all countries. Um, and that's largely because a lot of the, the inflation that we saw today rests in what we would call tradable goods. So goods where the prices are set on international markets. So there is a big part of today's uh, inflation story that, that is due to volatility on, on global financial markets. But it's also worth remembering that we do have an economy that, that's super, super strong at the moment. And that brings with it strong aggregate demand um, and so what that does mean is that there is an element of the inflation story which represents a mismatch between aggregate demand and aggregate supply. And so I think, you know, when, when all is said and done, yes, a lot of this is a global story. But if we look at something like housing, where we know that you know, the construction market has been super strong, the cost of building materials have gone up. You know, those are some of the things that might have a, a slightly more domestic flavour to them. So, in fact, all those many, many billions of dollars through um, pandemic support from the government is, is feeding into this. There's no getting around that. Yeah, I, think that I think that's fair because, you know, we know that a lot of that support landed in the household sector. Um, it went basically initially in the form of higher savings on household balance sheets because people were locked down and didn't really have the opportunity um, to spend that money, um, you know, fast and, and freely. As lockdowns ended, there was a lot of pent-up demand and all that money is now being put to work. So it's almost a little bit of a, a lagged effect and we've got this mismatch between demand and supply and that 
as economics tells us, tends to drive prices high. OK, well, the $64 million question today now, of course, let me ask both of you, does this inflation rate, rate hike translate into a hike in interest rates by the Reserve Bank when it meets next week? And if it doesn't, should it? Joe Masters? So we have brought forward our expectation for the first rate hike to next week. Not just the high level of inflation that we saw in the data, but the, the broad base of it, the fact that businesses are passing prices through. We had thought the bank would want to wait and see wage data, but I think today's numbers are pretty compelling. Uh, and then we expect a series of rate hikes from there, um, taking the cash rate higher over the next 12 to 18 months. Sally, should the bank move next week, the Reserve Bank, and, and how, how much should it raise them by next week? Well, I think in a world where the unemployment rate is, is as low as it's been in decades and core inflation is well above the RBA's target band and will stay there for the next couple of quarters, I think it's an environment where you know, the, the policy of least regret, as central banks like to think about it, is to start lifting rates. Um, so my expectation would be that they'll deliver um, a 15 basis point rate hike next week, and that'll take the target cash rate to 25 basis points. And what would it mean, what difference would it make if the bank holds off? We are in the middle of an election campaign. There's all sorts of sort of politics around this. Does the bank feel that political pressure? And what would it mean if they held off, Sally? So I think that the right way to think about this is that if the bank believes that there, there is a reason to do something, um, you know, the, the reasonable expectation of the Australian public should be that you know, the, the bank should deliver that. So I think you're exactly right. I mean, if, if we all agree that the economic circumstances are such that a cash rate of 10 basis points looks completely out of whack with economic fundamentals, um, there probably will be some questions asked as to, as to why the, the RBA didn't take the opportunity to to lift rates and, and I guess you know that, that's where the politics of this start to get a little bit more difficult. So, you know, my sense would be that, you know, sitting around the, the RBA board table next week, the view would be if we think the case for hiking rates is a compelling one today, then let's just execute. And Joe, do you have any sense of how much pressure there all is on the RBA board at a time like this in the middle of election campaign when inflation is high and interest rates are, you know, carefully poised for a lot of Australians? I think there's a lot of pressure on the RBA on a whole heap of fronts. The election's one of them. Any time you start a rate hike cycle, it's, you know, it's an emotive time for the Australian public, particularly those that hold a mortgage or have other debt. So it's not a decision that's ever taken lightly. I think the risk, though, is if the Reserve Bank don't hike next week, that if they then get some upside surprise on wage data in late May and early June, that they're then forced into, as we've seen global central banks start doing 50 basis point rate hikes. And that's a much more um, aggressive move in an environment where households have holding a lot of debt and therefore their balance sheets perhaps a bit fragile and vulnerable to those higher rates. OK, but what if they get a downside number on wages? As you mentioned, wages data comes out next month. The bank has, you know, two indicators it takes into account when it's looking at rates, and that's unemployment uh, and inflation. We've got the inflation number outside the band. But, you know, should it hold off to get the wages numbers? So it's got everything it needs, Jo? I actually think it does have everything it's, it needs, which is why you don't need to hold off the wage data. Um, very unlikely it surprises on the downside. Uh, we know that the wage shedding in Australia is quite rigid. It takes time for the low unemployment rate to feed through. But even the bank's own business liaison, which is a very widespread survey of Australian businesses, is showing them that wage pressure is rising, that businesses are telling them that. They can also see it in private agreements. So outside of EBAs and the public sector and, and those more rigid parts of the market. So uh wage rise you know, is coming and it is feeding through to inflation, which is already higher than they expected. OK. Is that um, subjective, though, Sally Old? I mean, wage forecasts are, I think, 2.4% for wages growth, which is, you know, half the inflation rate. Do you think the bank has all it needs to act on wages? So, so in April, they said, you know, we, we will sort of look at the, the wage and the inflation data and, and reassess, you know, what we think after seeing those numbers. Um, but that was back in early April, and since then, a couple of things have happened. Um, you know, we've got today's inflation numbers, which were much stronger than expected, and importantly, you know, suggest that the RBA will have to revise up its trajectory for core inflation when it releases its next, next set of forecasts. So that's one thing that's happened. And the second thing that's happened 
So the unemployment rate is at 4%, so it's continued to decline. Um, and so I think it's probably fair for the RBA to say, look, you know, things have actually changed quite significantly since we sat down, even though it was only a couple of weeks ago. And for those reasons, you know, the plan has changed and, and maybe we feel far more confident now that we don't need to see um, a wages data print. And as Joe said, wages data does lag Okay. Um, economic activity and and my sense would be on the balance of risks I think they'd be pretty comfortable that they have more than enough information um, to to make the call to, to hike rates in early May. Okay, well, just finally, you've both had a bit of a go at this, but can I pin you down? How high do you think rates are likely to go in this cycle, and how quickly? And what does that translate to in terms of extra cost on people's mortgages, Joe? Yeah, so at the moment we've got the cash rate at 1% at the end of this year and then heading up to 2% through next year. I think there's a risk that that 1% at the end of this year ends up being a little bit higher. If we look at the median mortgage in New South Wales, for example, uh, 100 basis points of tightening equates to about $530 a month for that average mortgage. OK, Sally Old? Yeah, I think that's fair. I, I think the RBA will probably do four rate hikes by, by the time that we that we get to Christmas this year. And I suspect it'll probably have scope to do a couple more um, in early 2023. So I think you know, somewhere between 150 to 200 basis points of rate hikes over the next 12 to 18 months is the most likely outlook. Sally Old, Joe Masters, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Pleasure. Fran. Well, if not controlled, of course, inflation has the ability to put a serious squeeze on household budgets and standards of living, as do interest rate increases too. Amongst other responsibilities, Stuart Robert is Employment and Small Business Minister, and he joins us now from Queensland. Welcome, Minister. Uh, Prime Minister Morrison held up some charts today pointing to market expectations of inflation running around 4.5% in Australia. It came in annualised, well above that and well beyond budget forecasts. Did it come as a surprise to you? We've been framing the election as a choice, as we've talked about, because we understand that there are difficult economic times. There's over $8 billion in the budget recently for cost of living pressure because we could see the inflation settings moving. And of course, we know from today's data, and we're seeing it globally, uh, at 30-year highs around the world. So we had planned for this. The budget was prepared for this. The $250 payments to those on fixed incomes, welfare, working age payments is flowing from today. So we were well geared for this. But these are still uncertain times and we need to be well prepared and very cognizant of the challenges we've got. And what's going to bring it back down into uh, the budget forecast range, which is just above 3%, 3.25% for next financial year? It's got a long way to drop in a relatively short period of time. Uh, what's going to bring that about? F purely fuel prices? If you think of the major drivers, over 5.7% for the cost of new housing and 11% for the impact of fuel. Now, we've We've, of course, from the budget, which isn't reflected in these numbers, had a 22% or 22 cent reduction in fuel excise. That equals about 25 basis points in inflation. Uh, that's brought in as a temporary measure to ease the inflationary impact. Uh, but the two big drivers we're seeing is war in Europe. And goodness, who would have thought we'd be talking about a war in Europe? And the impact that's had on price of fuel, and fuel goes right throughout the economy. And, of course, the supply chain constraints driven by upwards of 400% increase in the cost of containers. So we'll see those normalise uh, over time. And on the basis of those two normalising, we'll start to see the impact uh, of headline inflation dissipate. So this central claim that the government, your government, is running so hard on, Stuart Robert, that uh, you are best to manage the economy at a time when the inflation dragon is roaring and singeing household budgets, how can that be sustained as more than rhetoric? Because there are levers, I'll suggest, that you could have pulled a little earlier to rein some of this in. Well, our economic plan is working. The budget laid that plan out. It was very clear. We laid out over $8 billion of cost of living support for seeing where inflation was moving. And because it is a choice and because we are in an election co uh, construct and a campaign, compare that to the ALP's 
page planned they put today, which was about job cuts, a review, uh, and agreeing with us on multinational tax avoidance. That's their plan. 11 pages compared to our plan as a full budget. Well, on it's one element of, of their planning, economic plan, to be fair. Well, they came out today and said, here is our economic plan. Their words, not mine, compare the two plans. And that's what we're asking Australian people. And that's what this election is all about. We're saying that we need a strong economy for a strong future, and we're best able to do that. And here is our plan, and here's where we're going. All right. Compared what... to what Labor put forward today. OK. Now, if, if inflation is going to trigger anything, along with low in un unemployment, you would have to think it, it's a wage increase. When, though, for most workers? We're talking about a build-up of pressures, but still, it doesn't come month after month. Well, of course, unemployment now at the equal 48-year low at 4%, and we're expecting it uh, to get a three in front of it very soon. If you look at the average earnings, the national accounts, we're starting to see that above 3.2%, and the wage price index will follow. Now, we understand, of course, there's a lot of inertia in the Australian wages market by virtue of the public sector, EBAs, and the award structures. But right now, we're starting to see quite a large movement in people changing jobs. Each change tends to come with wage increases and all of the evidence. This is, I'm, I'm standing here in a, a lithium battery systems factory here in, in, uh, in, in Beanley in Logan Home uh, and just chatting with the owner here about the pressures he's got on staff. So we're seeing this everywhere. So there is ample evidence that wages are starting to move, as you'd expect. And, and move, what, in a noticeable direction within months or this year? Because well, it's been elusive. It's been so elusive for so long. I just wonder what the timeframes are likely to be on this uh, wage well, price index the, increase. The, the average earnings in the national accounts tells us that they're starting to move now. And the evidence across businesses tells us they're starting to move now uh, as well. And that gets reflected, of course, in the wage price index uh, over time. Uh, we've forecast in the budget where we believe the wage price index will go towards a three in front of it. So we're very clearly outlining what our forecasts are from a budget point of view. And we've also outlined where we believe the unemployment will get to with a three in front of it. Mm. And all of that is, is says to the Australian people, the Liberal National Party and the Morrison government are the sound economic managers. And compared to this 11 page scribble today from the Labor Party, uh, I think the choice for Australians is fairly clear. Well, we've heard from an economist on this program, in fact, this afternoon, that it is conceivable that the average mortgage holder in a state like New South Wales might be up for an extra $530 per month in repayments once interest rate increases, uh, multiples of them, start to flow through. Uh, that will erode all forms of cost of living support that you built into your budget, and, and pretty soon, won't it? Well, that's based on a 200 basis point rise that no one is predicting this year. Well, Can I just make that Yeah, up to 1% by the end of this year, I think, was, was the prediction. That is true, but the numbers you just rolled out are based on a full 2%. So let me just be very clear about numbers, because numbers matter now when this is a choice framed for the Australian people. And that choice is clear. Whether the Morrison government's economic plan that is detailed, laid out, including over $8 billion in the budget to assist with cost of living, including a full 22 cent reduction in the price of fuel indexation, which the current figures don't take into account, versus the 11 pages we saw today. That is the choice, and that's how this election is framed. All right. Now, your LNP colleague, Matt Canavan, has suggested that net zero carbon emission target is, quote unquote, dead. Is that helpful to your endeavours, your campaigning efforts there in South East Queensland in particular? The government's position is very clear. Uh, we have agreed, both the Liberal and the National Party, as a coalition government, that we will have net zero by 2050. It's a clear policy. It was taken to both party rooms, including the National Party room. Should he be uh, that's, censured that's then the... if he's speaking out at sensitive moments like a structured formal election campaign with positions that aren't party policy? I'll let the National Party leader deal with, with, with his party. Uh, but it's very clear what the coalition's policy is. But more importantly, it's working. It's detailed. There's a detailed plan behind it. We've already seen over a 20% reduction of our emissions based on 2005 levels. And, of course, we've increased our forecast where we believe by 2030 we'll have a 30 to 35% reduction. So our plan is working. And more importantly, our plan is not based 
on a sneaky tax designed to hurt large businesses. All right. Well, that's a, an argument that I know Labor will uh, continue to contest and which we don't have time to go into right now. Stuart Robert, thanks for joining us once again on Afternoon Briefing. Great to talk to you. OK, so, yes, uh, a few figures bandied around Thanks. there, Fran, and uh, Stuart Robert was uh, uh, quibbling quite correctly with us uh, projecting out to one year what was a two-year uh, projection by uh, one of your economists, Joe Masters. But uh, that figure of $530 per month in extra payments uh, by the end of next year, to be fair, which is her prediction, uh, would send a shudder, I imagine, down the spines of many home borrowers. Yeah, well, I guess uh, we can check that and we will check that. But I thought it was actually higher. I thought it was higher under 2% too, Greg, but, you know, we can check it. Uh, whatever it is, it's a lot of money on big mortgages that people are paying, particularly in the major capital cities, but not only in the major capital cities. People have taken out, you know, high price hikes in, yeah. it, well, certainly the majors of Sydney and Melbourne, but also Canberra, also Brisbane, also the major regional centres have been quite astronomical. So people have significant mortgages, you know, average mortgages of four, five, six hundred, even seven hundred thousand dollars. These are high mortgages. That means people are highly geared and they're going to be very, very sensitive to any interest rate hikes. And yeah. this is this is what, you know, everyone is concerned about now. Yeah, historically high levels of gearing, in fact, um, courtesy of the asset um, price increase that we had throughout the pandemic. So I guess uh, whether you're on the government side or the opposition side, it's kind of like this, this train is coming, but uh, let's hope it doesn't inflict too much pain before we get to, let's say, the 21st of May anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And of course, it feeds right into an election where both sides have, you know, conflicting or competing economic, um, economic messages. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. I'm sure the polls will be telling us that, Greg. We've had yeah. two major opinion polls published this week. Both showed there's been very little shift in public opinion despite the first two weeks of election campaigning. I'm joined now by William Bow, election analyst and publisher of The Poll Bludger, and Ben Executive Director of the Australia Institute. Welcome to you both. Thanks, Fran. Hi, William. Um, Hello. Ben, two major polls published this week. Neither showed much shift. Is that good news for Labor, which seemed to go, according to all the polls, into this election ahead? And it had a you know, pretty rough start there from Anthony Albanese in its first week. How do you see those two polls? Well, yes, if it stays at 53 or 55, as some polls have had it, two party preferred to Labor, They'll win, notwithstanding there's a difficult seat count. It's not the national poll that counts. It's the counting up the 151 seats that counts. And they've got to get to 76 and they've got to win seven seats from where they are. And most people are giving them a couple of seats in Western Australia. And I think Boothby looks good for them in South Australia and maybe Reid and in New South Wales and Chisholm and hope for them they'll be looking at Tasmania. But you see, just listing off those seats, you don't get to seven quickly. But if the polls stay at anywhere near 53 or 4, then the seat count will be there for them. I think the danger is that um, in the past, um, elections have narrowed getting closer to polling day. And on the arithmetic, I think a lot of people think that the coalition can win with a 2PP for them of um, only 49 or 48 and a half. You remember John Howard won an election with 49% of the 2PP. Um, and um, uh, I think that, that will be the, the sniff that the coalition is hoping for. At 53%, um, then Labor would win a majority government. But um, if it narrows at all, then I think the... Uh, and there's some evidence suggests that it might on historical basis, then you'd think that a minority parliament probably is looking as likely as not at this stage in the election campaign. OK. William, that's talking about the two-party preferred vote. There's been a lot of talk around lately about the primary votes because they look very low for both major parties and there doesn't seem to be much shift in them. I think Labor this week, News Poll had them at 37%. Ipsos had them down at 34%, which is just a tad over their primary vote when they lost last time around. The Coalition's vote is low too. There is a slab of undecided, but it's not that big, I don't think. With such a low primary vote, how worried do you think the major parties would be about what, what Ben was saying there, a hung parliament, and how focused are they, do you think, on that, that primary vote? What are they wanting to see? 
Well, as Ben says, if Labor are at 53.47, then the, the tide is going to be, you know, high enough to raise their boats, so to speak. Uh, but uh, most observers will be factoring in a narrowing. I'd, you know, a 53-47 win for Labor would be, you know, up there with their historically best results ever. And it just doesn't feel like the, the environment is quite that strong for them. And you, traditionally, Labor especially, I think, tend to, to blow big opinion poll leads during campaigns to, to an extent. So the question is, if the two-party preferred does come down from 53-47 to perhaps sort of 51 49, then we are looking to see if those historically low major party primary votes start converting into a bigger crossbench. And, uh, you know, th th there are a lot of scenarios around where that can occur. The, the Liberals are under a lot of pressure from various independents around the place. And uh, yeah, when the two party preferred, you know, narrows to that point, then you know you really are at, at a point where that that mediocre primary vote for them both does mean that neither of them makes it over the line in seat terms. Well, I can predict on the basis of past elections, we've all seen many of them, that in a week or two the focus is going to be very much on preference deals because that's what we're talking about here when we talk about two-party preferred preference votes. You've been looking, William, at the impact of One Nation and Clive Palmer's United Australia Party. What can you see about in terms of you know, what their preferences may or may not decide. Well, they're a bit unpredictable because there was a dramatic increase in the share of preferences that the coalition received from, uh, from One Nation in 2019. And uh, all of that anti-Labor advertising that Clive Palmer ran in 2019 uh, really fed into a high flow of preferences from his party to the coalition. Uh, it's difficult to see that increasing much this time, but uh, you know you, you just never know. That 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 is a highly variable factor, and it. Uh, I, I think the sort of extent to which the Liberal Party are relaxed about seeing the Catherine Deves controversy play out. Uh, I think that that is uh, part of a strategy to cultivate preference flows from, uh, you know, minor parties. They accept that they have lost a share of their vote to those parties and the path to victory for them is getting those votes back as preferences. So, you know, while that particular issue might not play well in the kinds of, uh, you know, affluent electorates where they're under pressure from independents, we're hearing a lot of talk from, uh, you know, via, via press gallery journalists that what they're hearing from the Liberal camp is that we think that this issue is playing really well among the kind of voters that we're losing to Hanson and Palmer. Ben, are you hearing that too? And are you seeing any sign for, of, from uh, the Clive Palmer camp, UAP, what they might do? It was quite late in the campaign last election when Clive Palmer sort of brought out those ads non-stop it would seem against Bill Shorten and against Labor which you know Labor certainly believes carried a lot of momentum against them in those last couple of weeks. They haven't seen that from Clive Palmer yet. He's not acting like a friend of the government this time. No I, I think that advertising campaign um, and where he points that is more important than uh, preferences. Uh, we've been tracking his vote for a little while and haven't had it outside that two to four percent range really um, actually stronger in Victoria than in Queensland counterintuitively but if you think about it he is tapping into a, a genuine vote this time I think last time wasn't clear what his constituency was but he's built it around an anti-vax and um, anti-lockdown uh, movement if you like it's small but it's real uh, so it's, it's unclear where the preferences go but it, it's I think it's important always to remember that it's the voters that decide the preferences in the end when they go into the ballot box box and not the parties and I think the voters preferences for those uh, parties for One Nation and uh, UAP are particularly influenced by the current mood or the current trend so if the coalition has a very good last week or two in the election campaign they're likely to get a higher percentage of those preferences than they would have uh, but conversely if it stays at about where it is they'll probably get uh, a, a, a Labor will get enough of a share to win them and Okay. While the primary vote is important and everyone talks about needing to get to 40%, you know, to somehow uh, win a majority, it's not really critical. It, 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 if you get those preferences, you can still win those seats. Um, Anastasia Palaszczuk won the 2017 election with a primary vote of 35%. But the increased size of the crossbench and the difficult seat count that both sides make 
means that a hung parliament is more likely, given that we expect all the existing independents, bar Craig Kelly, to be elected. And you'd have to bet on current published polls that at least um, one or two of the independents or potentially more in either Sydney or Melbourne or even Curtin in Western Australia, where I'm told the ground game is looking good for um, the teal independent there. Kate Cheney, no guarantee of a winning, but momentum on the ground there, I'm told. So you'd have to expect one of those to at least win. And with an expanded crossbench, the, 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 just mathematically, the increases the likelihood of a hung parliament, regardless of primary vote. William, just a quick um, observation from you. I wonder whether you're, you, you, you think too that at least one of those teal independents, if not more, and perhaps the Curtin candidate, is likely to get elected? Well, you know, it's, it's, they seem to all be very close races. And, you know, the, 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 the best guess is that one or two here and there might get up. I also wouldn't rule out there being uh, a couple of rural independents who aren't being spoken of much winning. Whereabouts? Um, um, the, the Cedar Nichols in regional Victoria, um, where Damien Drum, the Nationals member, is retiring. Uh, there's uh, the Hinkler in Queensland, Bundaberg. You've got the, the mayor of Bundaberg, Jack Dempsey, is running there. He's our, a former state member. And uh, these are sort of occurring a bit away from the glare. You know, they're, they're not getting as much publicity, these sorts of contests. I don't think these candidates are sort of existential threats for the government. I think we're talking about conservative independents here who, you know, assuming they are as competitive as I'm suggesting they might be. Right. I, 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 they, they would back a Morrison government. But, you know, it, it does, you know, feed back into that sort of issue that we're talking yeah. about, that the lower the primary vote for the major parties gets, the more opportunities there are for these sorts of candidates to sneak through. The bigger the crossbench, the higher the likelihood of a hung parliament. OK, let's come to the here and now. The story today, inflation. Wonder how that feeds into both sides, well, well the end result of this campaign. Ben, I know the Australia Institute's been in the field uh, testing the, the major messages of both Labor and the Coalition. What did your research find and how do the inflation rates today uh, fit into that? Well, a couple of things. We've found that the economy is, is back in front as the most uh, important issue in the election campaign. We also had a look at uh, the messages of each side of politics and what tested best. Uh, interestingly, it was the negative messages of each side about the other uh, that tested b best and uh, Labor's message about the Prime Minister being announcement and no delivery and follow through tested well and for the government their negative message about Labor uh, not being strong on the economy tested well. Labor's message m tested marginally better for them than the government's negative on Albo tested. Um, but I think the, the interest rate decision that's likely to come next week, I think the RBA will in, in lift rates on Tuesday off the back of this high inflation numbers. Now, I think traditionally the idea is that the coalition does well when economics or economic management is being discussed. But I think it's more complicated than that. It's really the terms on which the economy is being discussed that counts. And the fact that Labor's been running a big cost of living campaign and has been running a big campaign about uh, record low wage growth, um, this announcement today kind of plays into their frame and certainly Jim Chalmers was making the most of that today. And I think, conversely, the Treasurer, I think, is a very good campaigner, a good performer, didn't look as confident as he usually does today. And I put that down to two things. One, massive inflation rise. And two, the issue we were talking about before, he's under massive pressure in his own seat. And the fact that he had to spend so much of his press conference today talking about his opponent in what is regarded as a blue ribbon Liberal seat um, tells, you a, tells you a lot. Uh, and I think the combination of those two things, the, the Treasurer being in a knife fight in his own seat, and inflation on the rise and interest rates, uh, my prediction, is set to be raised by the RBA on Tuesday, m m makes it not as simple as to say that just because we're discussing the, uh, the economy, it's good for the coalition. Yeah, William, we'll get your view on that. I mean, Labor's slogan from the very beginning has been everything's going up except your wages, and mm. here we have the inflation rate, and next week we might have the interest rate rise. So uh, it would, that would seem to fit into their slogan. But, but what do you think? If interest rates rise next week, which party do you think it benefits, or clearly we can see which, which party that's likely to benefit? The government who's saying don't risk Labor at times like this, or Labor is saying look what they went and did? 
I think on balance you'd have to say Labor, but you know I also think there is something in the notion that it will, you know, emphasise the Liberal Party's message that these are uncertain times, and the the, the Liberals have a kind of built-in brand advantage on the economy. Uh, it's uh, we're, compare that, for example, with 2007, where uh, interest rates. Uh, rose throughout the final term of the Howard government. That Including in the election campaign. Indeed. That, however, uh, directly ran against the line that Howard ran on in 2004, which you know, the entire focus of their campaign on that occasion was all about interest rates. We're the party to keep them low. You know, after three years of failing to do that, they were judged on that. Uh, the, the Morrison government is not carrying the baggage of interest rates that directly because, you know, the, the interest rates have been extremely low throughout the time of the Morrison government and I, I think a lot of voters would regard the circumstance that are causing interest rates to rise as out of their control. Ben, just finally, do you agree with that? Do you think it sort of underlines the government's risk message about Labor, oh, rates are going up, everything's going up, we'd better stay where we are, or...? Well, I, I think that's what they're going to try and prosecute. And you saw the Prime Minister, he had his press conference this morning, um, but then held a kind of impromptu one late this afternoon with his candidate in uh, the MP for Leichhardt, Warren Inch, to directly try and turn the tables. I think on, 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 on any normal metric would look like a bad announcement for the government uh, inflation rising well outside what was the mainstream prediction of how high it would be um, and had to hold that in property press conference. And I, again, I, I come back to this wage growth issue. I, I, I saw um, Michelle O'Neill from the ACTU saying this afternoon that they had calculated that this effectively meant that workers got a, had a $2,000 pay cut just in the first six months of this year will have one as a result of this, and that's on top of an effective pay cut of 800 dollars last year and if that argument gets going it turns the table on the kind of more abstract notions of economics into a more kitchen table economics and I think it's that battle whoever wins that battle and turns the economic if, if Morrison is able to keep it at a high level about economic management he'll win but if Labor can turn it into kitchen table economics they'll win. Well I guess it all goes down to sentiment on the ground really. What are people feeling? It's all very well to say wages groups are going up despite what the stats are saying but what are people feeling? Before I let you go William you're on the ground in Perth. Do you have any direct mail on that seat that Ben was talking about earlier, the seat of Curtin where there is an independent Kate Cheney running um, against the Liberal MP? Oh, she's got significant ground game, I'll say that much. You know, the, there is a, clearly a, a core flute war going on in Curtin. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it, it's focusing a lot of attention. It's, uh, you know, filling up a lot of the, the media coverage about the election in Western Australia. And uh, it's certainly, you know, in the mix among those seats, um, the, the rest of which are all in Sydney and Melbourne. And uh, from my perspective, I think it'll make for a very interesting election night. Uh, we won't be able to... I, I doubt the result will be settled before Western Australia's results start coming through. And uh, both the size of the swing which appears to be on in Western Australia and that wild card of Curtin, uh, I think are going to loom quite large on the night. Well, I think there's a very big chance. Do you both agree we won't get a result on election night? Isn't something like 40% of the result going to be postal ballots or ballots that are going to be counted over the next days? Yeah, well, the, the um, postal, the pre-poll period has shrunk slightly this election from last time, um, but there's no doubt that that, that pre-poll figure is likely to be at 30% and then there's postal. So in a close election, you might not know, but uh, I wouldn't rule out having a, a result on election night. But I do think that we've got a, a, an interesting contest this time. Of course, all parties pace um, battles on their kind of left and right flanks, but there are a number of more seats that are under threat from independence this time. So th there could be long, long nights for many candidates. Yeah, OK. All right. Well, uh, I've shared those nights with both of you at different times. So thank you and good luck. And uh, thank you, William. Thank you, Ben. Ben, since we spoke to you last time here on the program, you've been married. I like, got married. I'd like to say congratulations to you. And uh, good luck with that. I hope it's a wonderful, wonderful union. And thank you both of you for joining us. Thanks, thank Fran. You. It was a lovely, lovely wedding on a lovely day. Great. 
OK, it was timely to hear Ben Oakwist's reference there to an impromptu a doorstop or media comment made by Scott Morrison this afternoon because most of the Prime Minister's remarks on inflation had been made before the figures came out from the Bureau of Statistics. But there he was in North Queensland this afternoon, uh, hours after the figures came out, and Scott Morrison took on some questions from reporters about these rising prices. The Treasurer, I think, has set it out well today in terms of uh, the serious nature of what we're seeing all around the world. I mean, we have got significant forces impacting on our economy and economies all around the world. And that has been principally driven, as we know, by those big surges in petrol prices and oil prices that uh, haven't found its way um, in terms of, through to the figures in terms of what we've been doing to relieve that at this point. Um, but that is occurring as a result of forces we're seeing far away from here. And I think Australians understand the impact of that. And on top of that, there's the issues of supply chains that continue to be straining as we've come through COVID. But at the same time, what we are seeing, you're right, Australia at 5.1 per cent, but we see countries like Canada and New Zealand uh, and the UK up around 7 per cent, and the United States even higher, over 8 per cent. And so what we are seeing is, I think this is underlining the point that we've been trying to make all the way through this election campaign. There are so many moving parts in our economy at the moment. And the stresses and the risks in our economy with the pressures that are coming in are very, very real. And they have an impact when it comes to how much people pay. And so there is a choice about who Australians believe are going to be able to best able to manage to keep those pressures down on rising costs of living, keep pressures down on what are pressures to rise interest rates. And the reason that is occurring, I think Australians understand. But what we have demonstrated by keeping that AAA credit rating, by having an inflation rate that's below what we're seeing in other countries like Canada and New Zealand, points out very clearly that we're a government, the Liberals and Nationals, who can manage these issues and keep as much pressure downward on those rising forces as opposed to a Labor Party who doesn't have an economic plan, that can't manage money, and you don't know. The last time the Reserve Bank of Australia raised interest rates during an election campaign was 2007. Mm. Didn't end well for then Prime Minister John Howard. How do you feel about the prospect of having the RBA hike rates next week in May? Maybe. Well, that's, that's always a decision for the Reserve Bank. We have an independent Reserve Bank. Last time that occurred, interest rates, uh, from memory, were around about 6.4 per cent. Uh, that was the cash rate. Cash rate now is 0.1 per cent. Well, there's going to be a lot of that kind of talk over the next few days. In fact, the increase in cost of living and the impact on family budgets will be discussed further tonight in an ABC News special presented by Roz Childs. Roz, hi there. Hey, Fran. Roz, we've been discussing on the show today uh, very, today's very high inflation figure surprised most people. What are you going to be looking mm. at tonight in the special? As you say, Fran, as you've been looking over the last uh, hour, these numbers just confirm the cost of living is a major issue for everybody day-to-day, uh, -day, and it's also a major issue of the election campaign. Just to run through some of the numbers uh, for everybody once again, prices are up pretty much across the board. Fuel is a major component, of course, up 11% uh, over the quarter. Also, housing construction costs, food is up as well. So annual inflation has come in at 5.1%, uh, higher than economists were thinking, which makes them believe that the Reserve Bank is going to start raising interest rates as early as next week. Uh, interest rates have been at that historic low of 0.1% of course for the last two years, but we haven't seen an interest rate rise for the past 11 years. That's going to be, it, it is, isn't it? Something of a shock uh, for a lot of people as they see their mortgages going up for the first time for a long time. And it's thought there'll be a series of rate rises over the course of the next few months. So in the special tonight, we'll be looking at where the pressure on prices is coming from, how people are feeling about it and how people are just managing to make ends meet. And we'll be hearing from economists, pollsters and politicians, um, in particular Shadow Treasurer Jim Chalmers and the Finance Minister Simon Birmingham will be giving us their views. And we'll also be chatting to uh, a guy called Jack Tranquil. He's the owner of a roadhouse that's uh, based 800 k's north of Perth. It's called the Billabong Roadhouse. So that includes a petrol station. He offers accommodation. He's also got a restaurant. So he's in a great position to talk about what his customers are telling him about how they're feeling about the rising cost of living. That's all coming up at 8 p.m. on the News Channel tonight. Yeah, I'm sure Jack's been experiencing the pressures as well. Ross, thanks very much. Ross Charles. And that special is on tonight at 8 o'clock Australian Standard Time on the News Channel. <laughs> Thank you.
rolling on today in an extended edition this Wednesday. Fran and I are here for about an extra 30 minutes or so. Fran, uh, until they get rid of us anyway, with a few more issues to get through and a little bit plenty of... Plenty to talk about, Greg. Plenty to talk plenty about. Plenty to talk about. Why don't we uh, clean up a few facts and figures because we have had our fact checkers just looking over that prediction uh, trying to relate to every borrower what uh, interest rate increases might translate to in their repayment. So just Joe Masters uh, made a prediction there that based on certain assumptions about increasing interest rates, uh, $530 extra per month would have to be repaid by the average mortgage holder in New South Wales. Uh, I think we've had it clarified now, Fran, that that relates to the end of this calendar year. Mm. So that a is... A 1% increase, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. So that's the end of 2022, just in case anyone thought that was the cumulative effect over two years through to the end of 2023. Uh, what that means to me, Fran, is that that is great mortgage sensitivity there, repayment sensitivity. $530 a month extra uh, in that state alone, uh, we're talking in about six months from now, seven months from now. Well, that's right, and no-one thinks the Reserve Bank's going to stop there. I mean, both our economists thought they're likely to go to one5 and 2%, so that's going to be even more, Greg. Yep. Uh, now, there's also the matter of, uh, of interest, uh, sorry, of climate change too, Fran, which we haven't really got to today except uh, in a question in one of our interviews. But we do want to explore that because it's a matter of record, isn't it, that LNP Senator Matt Canavan said a cat amongst the pigeons here on afternoon briefing yesterday with his repeated claim that, in his view, all bets are off on the UN's net zero by 2050 commitment, or, to use his word, precisely that it is, quote, unquote, dead. Uh, and that really did get a few people running hard, Fran. Yeah, it certainly did. I mean, we noted it at the time and um, it was quite, it got quite heated there in that exchange between, with you and Matt Canavan and Murray Watt. Uh, but, you know, Matt Canavan, he really pushed that hard and set off a ricochet that's continued for almost 24 hours now. Moderate coalition MPs who'd fought for the net zero commitment in the first place were angry. Scott Morrison came out insisting the carbon reduction pledge of net zero by 2050 still stands. Labor arguing the coalition quote, at war with itself. And Central Queensland Nationals MP Michelle Landry, speaking for many, I think, when she looked directly at the camera and said to Matt Canavan, pull your head in, Matt. So, you know... The net zero thing is all sort of dead anyway. It's all over. I mean, it's all over by the shouting here. There'll be some who disagree with it at the time, and I suspect they still will. But that doesn't change the government's policy. We're in the middle of an election campaign, and you've got the government at war with itself over climate change. Yeah, pull your head in, Matt. That commitment from the coalition is clear, firm and non-negotiable. All right, so there's a bit of reaction and action, reaction uh, rattling through there. Fran, why don't we update it or, or completely square this off? Because after being told to pull his head in on climate policy, Matt Canavan did soon enough regroup with his national colleagues there in Rockhampton, Michelle Landry amongst them. Uh, the Queensland Senator did, didn't exactly retract anything he said about net zero uh, for 2050, but he did acknowledge that he'd spoken to Michelle Landry and to others about all of this. The great thing about the Nationals Party is uh, we, uh, we tell everybody in the public what we say in private and uh, we, we have robust conversations in the bush in the country and that's what I love about the Nationals Party and I'm good friends with Michelle but sometimes we have disagreements we can still have a drink at the end of the day. Right, that's the Nationals' way of things, apparently. Uh, one person who might know uh, how these differences are resolved, if ever, is former Nationals leader and Federal MP for the seat of Riverina in New South Wales. Michael McCormack joins us now. Welcome back to the program, Mr McCormack. And, uh, yeah, net zero climate policy. Is it on track? Shaken, if not stirred, I would have thought. On track. On track. Will be delivered. That's what we said we'd do. That's what we signed up to do, and that's what we will do. But I do agree with Matt Canavan on one thing when he says that we are allowed to say what we think in the Nationals, indeed in the Coalition. I do note that Tanya Plebisek, a very good spokesperson for Labor, and Bill Shorten have both been sidelined from the campaign trail, and that's a shame for them. Uh, Labor have uh, made sure that they, their transcripts aren't being typed up 
and well, issued. Maybe the I transcripts, what, but they're out talking. We from, know that because we've spoken the to them. What you see from the Liberals is, is what we think. All right. Well, I know they're out there talking, even if the transcripts are being processed, because uh, we've interviewed them on afternoon briefing. OK, so you're saying the disagreement is tolerated within the Nationals family. It does rather raise the question, is Matt Canavan alone in acting as an insurgent or guerrilla fighter against this policy? It doesn't look like he is. Well, the important thing and the, the thing that we should be talking about, because let's just park net zero for a moment, because it is going to happen. Let's face that. We've signed up to it. Uh, we, we had an agreement uh, Sunday, 24th of October 2021. The National Party agreed to it. Uh, investment in hydrogen energy, uh, rewards for farmers for uh, carbon farming, and indeed uh, an infrastructure and roads program came as a result of that. And that's being put into place. But let's park that for the moment. We, we need to be talking about the things that people are talking about around their living room table, and that's jobs. And today you heard the Prime Minister and the Deputy Prime Minister talking about the 450,000 jobs that are going to be created over the next five years through a $21 million program. Uh, this is great for regional Australia, great for energy security, uh, great for all those uh, resources and agricultural sectors which uh, do so much of the heavy lifting as far as our economic productivity is concerned in Australia. Right, but that's not really worthy of bragging rights, is it? Because that 430,000 I mean, component jobs, goes with population growth. We're not talking about growth. what people are talking about in their living rooms. Yeah, but that, those jobs growth uh, proportions that go with regional Australia are merely in line with population growth, as is the $1.3 million jobs target that the Coalition, uh, as a single entity, holds for the next five years. Indeed, you get there you without little the policy National work. Just last week, when uh, Julie Collins uh, was talking about agriculture, or perhaps I should say, not talking about agriculture, everything she was asked, she said, "I oh, will decide that later in the campaign." Well, there's only about three and a half weeks if that left of the campaign. Labor needs to start telling us what it is going to do. But don't ever believe what Labor says it's going to do. Have a look at their record when in government, and it's not good. Our what? record is about delivery, about record infrastructure, and that's what we need to be talking about and focused on. That's what I certainly am, and I know that Matt Canavan will get on with that too. All right. Well, having a job is important. So is meaningful pay. Uh, I assume most uh, mortgage holders in your electorate will now be bracing for an interest rate rise, an interest rate rise that will almost certainly come ahead of, across the board, pay increases. That much you'd agree on, wouldn't you? Well, look, again, as you heard the Prime Minister saying today, these... Uh, these matters are a matter for the Reserve Bank of Australia and, and indeed wages are a matter uh, for the Fair Work Commission. Uh, but I can remember when I first got into uh, the housing market back in the mid-1980s, uh, paying interest rates of north of 18%. I mean, if they were that high these days, people would be marching in the streets and perhaps rightly so. Well, uh, they, they might if their wages the are going backwards. Josh Frydenberg has done a marvellous job through covid to protect lives, to protect livelihoods. And we'll go on focusing on those economic parameters and matters that uh, are concerning uh, Mr and Mrs Average right across Australia. Right, but you are suggesting, I suspect accurately, that people would be in uproar if they were struggling to meet their mortgage commitments. Uh, but we do have this modern phenomenon of struggling to meet them potentially while wages go backwards. Hard to quantify, but well, the union movement saying $2,000 in real terms. Crucial to all Australians. And that's why, as part of the budget, we lowered taxes. That's why, as part of the budget, uh, we looked at and addressed that 22% uh, uh, for the, or 22 cents a litre for the fuel excise. And so we're making sure that we put the parameters in place, we put the measures in place that are going to help the family budget. Any case, do you think, in light of today's inflation figures, to examine an extension? of any of those supports, fuel excise? Well, I'll leave that to, uh, I'll leave that to the Treasurer and to the, uh, uh, the Expenditure Review Committee. That's, uh, that's their call to make, and, uh, and I'm sure that they will, uh, as they always do, uh, review these matters. I'm sure that uh, uh, people can be absolutely reassured that uh, with a coalition government re-elected, that certainly they will be a lot better off with their uh, living affordability than they ever will be under a Labor government which will impose another carbon tax, irrespective of what Anthony Albanese might say 
and they will impose higher taxes because that is the Labor and that is the Anthony Albanese way. Just on that fuel excise, though, you're supporting a review of it and what's your own disposition, that it should be no, I'm just favourably no, looked at for an extension? I'm these, well, you said it should be reviewed. The expenditure Review Committee looks at all the time and, sure, after the six months, I'm sure that they will uh, have a look at it, but that will be a matter for the Treasurer to determine. All right, even though the legislation sunsets it at six months. Well, indeed, but that's what we've always done. That's what we did with COVID. Uh, we kept uh, reassessing where the economy was, uh, where the health outcomes were, and that's what good governments do. Uh, reassess these things, have a look at these things and make the appropriate decisions at the right time. All right, final one on ag workforce, Michael McCormack. Uh, there is a, a crying need for workers in the agriculture sector, but there yet are. your yeah. own ag visa scheme hasn't provided a single worker, only a piece of paper with Vietnam. If re-elected, what commitments can your party and your government make to actually get workers into that pipeline and onshore into Australia? Well, I know the Agriculture Minister is trying to work with the unions to achieve the outcomes that we need. I was only speaking to uh, Barton Brothers, Will Barton, this morning. Meat processors at Gundagai, they're desperate for workers. They can't fill the orders that they have uh, internally. And, of course, we've got uh, other meat processing plants, such as Chris Cummins' Breakout Meats at Cowra, they're trying to expand internationally. And so these are difficult times, not just for meat processing, but right across the agriculture sector. We will continue to make sure that we've got those uh, right uh, parameters and initiatives in place uh, with our Southeast Asian friends, indeed with our Pacific Island friends, who, we, who have provided a great workforce over many years in skilled and unskilled professions to help our agriculture, which is at around $66 billion. If we're going to make it uh, $100 billion by 2030, we need the right labour force and we'll absolutely make sure that we've got the right people in the right places across Australia uh, to do all the jobs in that wonderful sector. And would you be prepared to extend the Pacific side of the equation to make up for what, you know, what is a sluggish start at best for the Ag Visa program? Well, again, I'm sure Cabinet will work through those processes and do what they need to do to ensure that we've got the right number of workers coming into Australia. All right, a few weeks to go. Michael McCormack, uh, good luck out there on the campaign trail. Thanks Thank again so much, for Greg. joining us on Afternoon Briefing. And while the coalition tried to shrug off Labor's claims today that it's at war with itself over net zero emissions, the Prime Minister led the charge reviving an old scare campaign against Labor. There's a sneaky carbon tax which Labor is putting in place and it's not just on the coal mining industry. Here in, in Rockhampton and central Queensland, it's on, it's on fuel supplies, it's on petroleum, it's on gas, it's on um, the transport sector, it's right across the board. And Chris Bowen has built the cat on this, just like he did at the last election, you'll remember, when Chris Bowen built the cat on uh, taxes on, on superannuants and retirees. Here he is at it again. He's, he's actually told the truth. He does have a sneaky carbon tax on our traditional industries. And I can tell you, that's not good for Rockhampton. That's not good for North Queensland. It's certainly not good for Western Australia. So is Labor's policy to use the government's safeguard mechanism to cut emissions from big polluters a sneaky carbon tax? I'm joined now by someone who's been watching the carbon wars for 20 years at least, Tony Wood, the Energy Program Director of the Grattan Institute. Tony, thanks very much for joining us. Good afternoon, Frank. Is Labor's emissions reduction plan a sneaky carbon tax? Well, I don't think it's particularly sneaky for a start because Labor's been as clear as they probably can be about how they're proposing to include the industrial sector in their emissions reduction program to meet net zero by 2050, which is the same target the government has. The issue around what's, what's a tax and what's not a tax, um, unfortunately, I don't think it's particularly helpful as a description. I understand that language is important, but you know, the current government is always, the current coalition government, even since when John Howard was prime minister, has used taxation powers to introduce um, obligations on energy businesses, for example. So the Renewable Energy Target, um, with very successful program, I acknowledge, very successful um, through a Liberal government, Labor government, Liberal coalition government, um, has achieved high levels of emission reduction, but it was done through taxation powers. Right now, the safeguard mechanism, which is the thing that the Labor Party is talking about using, which was a policy introduced by the Abbott government, itself has been um, potentially not doing very much because it wasn't allowed to. Now, what Labor's proposing is to say, well, look, you've already got this mechanism. 
where if a company that's covered by that mechanism goes above the speed limit or goes above their baseline, they have to pay. They have to, one way to do that is to buy credits from somewhere else, um, offset those emissions if they're too high. Um, what Labor's proposing to do is basically reduce the speed limit steadily and over time to do more or less the same thing, but actually give it teeth as we recommended in a piece of our work last year and as the BCA recommended as well. Now, I don't, you know, this issue of whether or not we're going to call that a tax or not is not very helpful because the really important issue is how are we going to meet the unanimous view of net zero by 2050, which I think is once again clear that both parties want to do that. How are we going to do that at the lowest cost to our economy, making sure that where emissions can be reduced by uh, farmers, for example, doing things in their property, they can be paid for through credits that other people who can't reduce their emissions so easily will pay for. Now, okay. I don't, I don't, that's the sort of thing we should be talking about. Whether you want to label that as a tax, I just do not think it's helpful to what needs to be a constructive debate about one of the most important issues facing this country. Let me just go to the here and now, because you're saying Labor's policy, or part of it, this, this part for heavy industry, is based on the current existing safeguard mechanism that the Abbott government brought in. It's been expanded uh, again and again. Uh, currently, under the government scheme, if the big emitters, and there's 215 of them, the same 215 Labor would be targeting, if they exceed their agreed emissions baseline, do they have to pay to offset that? Well, they, have to, they, can, they can offset it. They can either fix it up. They're given, often given a couple of years to do that. If they're expanding their business, they've always been to go to the regulator and say, look, we want to increase our business size and we want a new baseline. They could do that. But if they can't do either of those things and are just for some reason above their baseline, then yes, they have to pay that. Um, the way they do that is they can meet that obligation by what they call a quitting emissions reduction credits, Australian climate change units or ACTUs. And those are created by activities which the government pays for um, through things like on-farm changes, things like industrial emissions in other areas, which are done at relatively low cost. It's a great scheme. I mean, the government should be credited for what's called the Emissions Reduction Fund because it's reducing emissions for less than $20 a tonne. That's a great scheme. And what this is doing is helping people to meet an obligation where their cost could be higher. And yes, those companies would have to um, buy those credits now. OK, just I let think me interrupt you there, Tony. What Labor's proposing, however, Fran, is a different way of doing that, because it may be that the government, it's the Labor government itself would fund these credits and the company itself would maybe not have to do that. But again, right. it's a very small cost. But just let me be clear here. You're saying that currently, under the government scheme, the big emitters are paid by the government to offset their emissions effectively, that we, the taxpayer, are paying that? Effectively. Well, effectively, the money either ends up in the hands of the government or in the hands of those people like farmers who found ways to grow trees and reduce emissions of their property. It's not exactly an uncontroversial mechanism. It's got to be cleaned up. But that's what happens here. And the government, through the Emissions Reduction Fund, has been expanded a couple of already once substantially on budget, pays to create those credits. And then the uh, readers who are above their baseline can then buy those credits on the market. And effectively, they then pay for that. Now, you know, the money goes around several ways. But there is an obligation imposed on it is above their baseline um, to meet that cost. That's what they have to do. They've already done it, some of them. Um, and what Labor's proposing to do, as far as I can see that, is to basically expose more companies to that by reducing the baselines over time. And so what Labor's proposing is the companies will pay. Uh, the government says that's a sneaky carbon tax. Currently, taxpayers' money is funding that. Uh, emissions reduction fund to the tune of how many billions? Do you know how many billions of taxpayers' money? Well, it's been several. I don't know how much is left. I mean, we've had the original fund was a couple of billion dollars. They've added a couple of billion dollars to that. It's still not spent. It's still got several years to go. Every year, the clean energy regulator enters into a series of auctions where they get the best value for money they can for what they're going to pay for. But basically, our taxes are being used, and I think not inefficiently, to pay for those sorts of activities. And what we're okay. now saying is the companies who have obligation could buy those same credits. And what Labor's saying is companies who are exposed to their base, their changes in the safe code mechanism would be able to meet that obligation using effectively the same credits. They may talk about it differently how they fund it, but fundamentally it's the same thing All right. where our taxes are being used to pay for emissions reduction. Um, we could do that directly that way, or we could do it through our electricity prices or other prices. But effectively, it's going out of both, you know, one of our tax pocket or our, um, you know, our cost of living pocket one way or another. Okay, we're almost out of time. But effectively, you're saying to cut emissions costs money, costs governments and taxpayers money. There's no cost-free way to do it. Can I just ask you this? If 
Because the government's saying this is going to be a big impost, the Prime Minister there saying not just on the coal industry but on the gas industry, on the cement industry, and he had a whole list. If coal miners had to pay for their emissions, what would it cost them? How much CO2 or methane do they produce per tonne of coal? What would this be costing? Under well, scale. currently, most of them, you know, it varies by coal mine, most of them are about, about 0.05 tonnes of greenhouse emissions per tonne of coal. 0.05 tonnes per tonne. Now, if that was then, say, for example, like whoever implements this policy says, right, you can um, buy offsets at whatever price you want. Let's say it was $24 a tonne, which is an example that Richard Miles has made. At that price, that would be about $1.20 per tonne of coal. $1.20 a tonne of coal. Now, right now, coal's been selling for, you know, between thermal coal and metallurgical coal, somewhere between $115 and over $300 a tonne, which is hardly a big number. And that's if they were to reduce all their emissions from day one. What Labor's proposing is that those emissions reductions would be imposed at a very small rate over the next 30 years, at the rate of, you know, uh, effectively 3% per year for 30 years. So it's not, this, is, this is almost going to disappear in the rounding for the coal miners. Now, they won't like it, paying some money, but I don't see that's a problem. Now, to be fair, Labor is not okay. proposing to look that way, but I'm saying that's what they could do, and the cost would be almost trivial. Tony Wood, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, Fran. Tony Wood from the Grattan Institute, Greg, and basically making the point that both sides are committed to emissions reduction. Both sides are actually proposing using the same mechanism, though Labor would be ramping theirs up. And currently, the government's already using taxpayers' money to pay for emissions reduction. Yeah. So is that a sneaky little carbon tax? Well, exactly. The nomenclature doesn't seem to matter much, does it, to the analyst who, who looks at it through a pretty clear lens. But, but of course, it's so charged when it's weaponised in the midst of, of an election campaign as a sneaky new tax. That's the government's phrase. Uh, but as Tony Wood says, Fran, it either comes out of your tax pocket or out of your cost of living pocket. Either way, uh, someone's paying for all of this. So um, let's see if the government can continue to prosecute that one. And uh, we might bring an update a little later, just before we sign off for the day too, Fran. We mentioned that we're on uh, YouTube today and there is running concurrently with that. A bit of a question about the extent to which voting uh, habits might be altered by high inflation. So we'll bring you an update on the, uh, the response to that question that's been running with our program today. Uh, just finally, though, this week's announcement by the ALP that it would abandon the Coalition's agriculture visa scheme has exasperated the Peak Farm Lobby Group, the National Farmers Federation. Labor's position is that it wouldn't expand the Southeast Asian-based ag visa concept which had only found initial support from one country anyway, that was Vietnam. Instead, it would favour expanded workforce access by Pacific Islanders and their families. Tony Ma is the Chief Executive of the NFF. He spoke to us a short time ago. Tony Ma, welcome to Afternoon Briefing. The NFF has had a bit to say about what now looks like a pretty stark policy difference between Labor and the Coalition. Uh, from what I read in your written statement, it sounds like you're accusing the ALP of dudding farmers. Why? That's right. We've been talking about the workforce problems and challenges that the ag agriculture industry has been facing for a number of years now. Uh, we've been in close consultation with members of the ALP for a number of months, knowing, of course, that there is an election looming. Uh, and we thought there was an opportunity for the ALP to demonstrate their commitment to agriculture, to farmers, but also to rural and regional communities. And it appears as if they've had a, uh, a substantial fail in that area. You they say a have... substantial fail, but w they would turn around and say, we could turn on the taps if we become government in a few weeks' time and have 50-odd thousand workers in the pipeline and beginning to arrive very quickly from the Pacific. What's wrong with that? Well, what we've, we've already got a, a scheme at the moment that has uh, enabled uh, lots of workers to come from the Pacific Islands, and it's a very successful scheme. What we want is uh, an additional visa that actually complements that scheme. So we remain supportive of uh, the Pacific Labor scheme. What it doesn't do is satisfy all the requirements of the agricultural workforce that we've been experiencing for a number of years. This is not a new issue. We've been talking to the Labor Party for years on this issue and the government. 
So, you know, we're really uh, disappointed and frustrated that we've spent a lot of time talking to the ALP uh, about a scheme that we think is a comprehensive solution, does complement uh, the Pacific Labor Scheme and the Seasonal Worker Program, um, but what they've put forward is basically saying, no, we don't want to listen to industry, we've got our own plans and we think that a Pacific Labor Scheme uh, will suffice and I can tell you it won't. OK, oh, I want to pick through that in a moment, but just on the process question, you say you've been talking to Labor. Its policy was effectively announced by Penny Wong with Pat Conroy and later backed up by Christina Keneally. Had you spoken to any or all of those individuals in the process? We've definitely been talking to Julie Collins, the opposition spokesperson for agriculture. We've definitely had a number of meetings with Christina Keneally uh, on this issue. We have done uh, the legwork and, and you know, briefed uh, key stakeholders on the issue from both sides of parliament and the crossbench. This is, again, not a new issue for us. So when uh, Penny Wong, as you say, announced this yesterday, we're a little bit frustrated that it wasn't Christina Kennelly, it wasn't Julie Collins. Here we have Penny uh, Wong uh, outlining what is, you know, a really um, tricky uh, bit of wordsmithing in terms of their commitment to what they're calling an ag visa. It's actually not. Right. It's an extension of the Pacific Labor Scheme, which we know is there and which we are big fans of. And what it doesn't do is support the agriculture industry and the needs that it requires. Right. But if they're elected in three or four weeks from now, they would take office with an ag visa scheme built around Southeast Asian nations which is only partially complete at best. I mean, only Vietnam has signed up to a memorandum of understanding so far. So there's not much to actually work with or work from for a Labor government. In that sense, wouldn't they be wise to double down on the Pacific, which is there and available? Well, we've put forward a program that includes, uh, we'd like to expand it beyond the government's committed to, you know, a number of countries in Southeast Asia. We want it expanded to a whole range of countries. We, in fact, don't want it limited. We'd love to see people coming from South America, from South Africa, from Europe. Uh, and, you know, we don't want to limit ourselves just to the Pacific Islands. We get that there is a, you know, strategic imperative to continue to build relationships, maintain strong relationships with the Pacific sector. And we, as I say, we are very supportive of the Pacific Labor Scheme. It does provide uh, a whole number of workers, but it is not the comprehensive solution that we're searching for in terms of our ag visa. There's no problem. You're not suggestive of any any problem with Pacific workers in terms no, of their work ethic or their reliability. You're not expressing any dissatisfaction about them. Absolutely not. They, as I say, it has been a really valuable program. But when you get into the details of the specific visas, the Pacific Labor Scheme or the Seasonal Worker Program is about, or at its core, is a program that is based around economic aid and you know bringing people over here for them to work and then go home and you know spend that money in their communities, which has a huge flow-on impact. We're big fans of that program, um, but it doesn't cater to the needs of all farmers of all sectors right across this country. Mm. So what we've put forward is an ag visa that complements uh, and enhances some of the, the existing regimes that are in place. And we put a lot of time and effort into that process. And for Labor to come out and try and say that they're going to, you know, do an ag visa, it's not. It yep. is not an ag visa. They might call it ag visa, but it will be in name only. Uh, you, have you got any hard numbers here, Tony Ma? Because whether it's a returned coalition government or an elected Labor government, you are pointing us towards severe workforce shortages in agriculture. What might that situation look like, let's say, uh, in nine to 12 months from now? It's tens of thousands of workers, Greg, and we've been talking about this for a long time. It has been obviously, like a lot of sectors, exacerbated because of COVID and the restrictions from international travel. So we're acutely aware of that. But it is tens of thousands of workers. So right across the industry, from pork to red meat to horticulture to dairy to grains, the agriculture industry uh, would love to employ domestic workers. We'd much, uh, you know, uh, be very uh, focused and, and attracted to employing domestic domestic workers. We just can't get them to come out and work on farms. It's seasonal work. You know, not everyone um, wants to live in rural and regional areas despite the great uh, facilities and things that are in some of those uh, places. We just can't attract 
domestic workers. So sure. we do need it to be complemented by international workers. And just finally, Tony, in the event, hypothetically, of a Labor government elect being elected, is this the end of the matter? Uh, would you continue to try to have their proposal tweaked? We'll continue to work with them. We're not giving up on this issue. It's too important to give up. We've been working on it for a number of years now. We'll continue working until we get a comprehensive solution. It is such an Achilles heel for the agriculture industry not to have a dedicated workforce and a comprehensive workforce solution, of which uh, we, we haven't got one from the ALP at the moment. We do want to see the ag visa by the government expanded beyond Vietnam, and we're really hopeful if they do get government that that will be expanded to other countries and quickly. All right, Tony Ma, we'll keep an eye on it, as I'm sure you are going to as well. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. Thanks, Greg. And Greg, before we go today, I just wanted to clarify, we spoke earlier to William Bowe. He's the uh, publisher of the online website Poll Bludger. And I just wanted to add that he mentioned something to us which I forgot to bring to air. He's been doing some consultancy work for Climate 200. That's the organisation which is financially supporting a number of the teal independents in this election campaign. So I forgot to mention that when I introduced him. He does a broad range of polling. We talked to him about his recent polling into the United Australia Party and One Nation, but just wanted to clarify that. No, fair enough. Full disclosure. And uh, you'd like to think it wouldn't, uh, wouldn't affect the sort of answers that he's giving to our questions anyway, Fran. And and uh, just to round off the references we've been making throughout our broadcast to uh, the YouTube screening of the program that's run concurrently uh, with the broadcast version today, sitting alongside that was a question that went to the story of the day, really, which is inflation. The question was, will the cost of living increase affect your vote? To which, Fran, 70% of people have answered that it would. 14% uh, said no, it wouldn't. And the rest, about 16%, uh, think that there are other things more important. We're told that they're now grappling online there on the YouTube channel with how to fix the GST. So it's an active and engaged audience. Self-selecting though, Fran, so we're not going to put too much store in our little uh, YouTube poll. Yeah, I think that might have just sent a shock through the coalition, Greg, if that's true, because, of course, uh, you know, they're in government right now, the cost of living is on, and Labor's got this whole cost of living pitch. Yeah. But still, the government would be also hoping that its $250 cheque, which should be arriving sometime soon in people's bank accounts after that budget announcement, might help too with their pitch on that. Yeah, exactly. No, it's just a talking point and we put no more store in it than that. So, yes, an extended version of this afternoon. Fran, we might try and look to do something like that uh, further into the campaign if it becomes manageable, if we're all not too fatigued by that point and remembering uh, what day it is would be a good indicator of that. But why don't we wrap it up for now and say our farewells, Fran. Uh, goodbye to you and that is Afternoon Briefing for today. Join both of us again. Again, same time tomorrow. See you.